friends in Jesus. May God bless you. It's Mother's Day, known as Christian Family Sunday as well. And it's a day when we acknowledge and thank our mothers and grandmothers for who they are as they have raised us and taught us how to love others as Jesus teaches. A couple of smiles. That is just a little bit of an idea here. A story of a mother's life trapped between a scream and a hug. A sweater is one of those garments that are worn by a child when his or her mother is cold. The most remarkable thing about mothers is that for 30 years she can serve the family nothing but leftovers. The original meal may never be found. When we think of Mother's Day, we often say and think about how busy mothers are. But we also have to think about mothers are part of a family, the Christian family. The Christian family that we are called to be a part of, and that is why we gather here to share today. For we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, created by God and called by the Spirit to move and share our love for one another. In order to do this, we must know ourselves. We must know ourselves. How do you identify yourself? That is, if given an opportunity to talk about you, what do you say? Where do you start? Who are you? What do you like to do? How do you share your time and with whom? Who are you in relationship with Jesus? Author and speaker Brandon Manning came up with this response to this very question, who are you, by responding, I am the one Jesus loves. He took that idea from the beloved disciple John, because in the Gospel of John, it's often mentioned the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loves. And so this man, Mr. Manning, he took this idea and he says, I am the one Jesus loves. And by doing so, put it in a suggestion that if Jesus is the one who loves me, how am I responding to that direct loving relationship? He says, maybe I can view myself differently at the end of the day when I, if I only identify myself as the one Jesus loves first. I am the one Jesus loves. A sociological theory of the looking glass self states that you can become what the most important person in your life thinks you are. Think about that. Anybody who is close to you has an ideal image of who you can become, like or even just an everyday occurrence. Think about who you are from the perspective of your spouse, your child, your coworker, your friend or even your cat or dog. Who are you? And just how would your life change if you truly believe the words that God loves you? You, the one that is reflected in the mirror. You, the one whom God sees and knows everything about. We read in John 15 that not only do we need to be connected to the vine to receive life and to pass it outwardly as his branches, but we need to know that God the Father, the Creator, really loves us and showed us how much. We read that if we truly want to experience Jesus' love, we are to follow God's teachings and commands, that is to reach out and love others his way. And if we do all those things, we'll have joy, complete joy within us and around us with all the people we meet. It's having that strong relationship with Jesus that enables us to identify who we are and sharing it with someone else. And to experience this complete joy, it doesn't mean that we're going to have everything wonderful all the time. Because not only do we experience positive things in life, we also experience negative things. 
And when those difficult things do occur, Jesus is there and will support you as that caring friend who knows what you're experiencing because he's had that experience too. And he will strengthen you and encourage you to endure what you have with a whole new outlook and determination. Jesus is there because he loves you for who you are. Who you are. Who are you? To love others means to love yourself. And to love yourself means knowing who you are in Jesus. When Jesus spoke to the disciples in this passage, it was not as teacher and student, but he makes it quite clear. He says, you are my friends. This is not to, when Jesus is speaking to the disciples, it's not too much long after this time that Jesus is, is arrested and tried and put to death. And he gives them a little bit of a history. He says, I called you to come with me. And you left everything and followed me. But you followed me anyway. You followed me because you knew that I was, something was going to happen that was different from your everyday life. And you know that you can always go back to doing what you did before. But when Jesus called them, the disciples followed. And in time, they clicked. They became friends. They trusted each other. They did everything together for three years. And they learned from each other, and they saw Jesus. Not just as the person that said, come on, but Jesus as the Son of God even though they didn't fully understand who he was. And here Jesus says, I now call you my friend. I am not just your teacher, I am your friend. You are not a servant to me, you are my friend. Jesus knew that he was going to die and these friends would leave him alone at the cross. Why? Because he needed to save themselves. But he trusted them so much that he wanted to enable, make sure that they were able to pass on the message of love. And he loved them, flaws and all. He loved them for not understanding what he was trying to teach them. He loved them while they ate and slept and prayed together. When he performed miracles and when he taught, he loved them. And they loved him back. Just as we who believe in who he was and is and will be, love him as well. So we're friends in Jesus, here together in this place. Brothers and sisters, one family in Jesus Christ. And in this place, we are enabled to reach out to others to show our love beyond the walls with those who are in need. And we know it's not always going to be easy or happy or fun. There will be moments when we will question our ideas, our abilities, and that is when you will look to those people who make a difference in your life. Some of those people are right here with you now. People who give you strength, who support your efforts, and people not afraid to challenge you. And all of these people are friends in Jesus too. As faithful people, we come together knowing that we all sin and receive forgiveness. But sometimes we don't even realize what we're saying and doing, causing our friends in Jesus to be hurt. So let's take a look in the mirror. Are you sandpaper or velvet? A new perspective. Sandpaper or velvet? For how we approach and respond to people in their times of need makes a difference in how we are seen as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Sandpaper. It's rough and tough to touch with your fingers. It can scratch your hand if it's really coarse or bumpy. But when it's doing its task properly, it is because of its roughness that is used to make something that was rough, smooth, in new ways. It takes away the bumps. There's just a little bit on the side as needed. But as the sandpaper smooths the edges, weaknesses are also revealed. Uncertain flaws are noticed. 
and blemishes of the tree it once was are revealed again. Maybe you are like sandpaper, at least sometimes. Maybe because you know of family or friends who bring out the worst instead of the best by robbing you the wrong way, uncovering weakness rather than strength. We know that Jesus had a friend, a disciple, who was definitely rough. He knew that he would never understand him, and Jesus knew that he would betray him near the end. He was like sandpaper to him. Yet Jesus loved him just as he loved all the other disciples. And yes, Jesus also laid down his life for him. Or maybe you're like velvet. You know how to give comfort and are supportive in your actions and words. You really understand others, especially if you've been rubbed by the sandpaper type people. The vow that people really know how to bring out the best in you. And all they can hear are weaknesses. They tangibly reveal God's love just when you need it most. And Jesus loves those who are like velvet because they encourage others, for he too encouraged his disciples to try something different. Jesus encouraged those disciples his friends, to be supportive of one another, just as he himself was supported by them as he walked the Via Dolorosa, even though they walked away to save themselves. Jesus knew he was loved. Jesus laid down his life for those who are like velvet, so whether you fit in as sandpaper and velvet, maybe there is an in-between place as well. Somewhere in between, you strive to share your love with your words and actions, and whatever you do reveals more about you than you realize. Our intentions, our intentions are always good. Because Jesus says we're called to love each other, but what actually happens might be pain and hurt revealed. What can you do? You take a close look at who you are in the mirror. That's who God sees. And God can change you by asking for God to reveal himself in you and to reveal Jesus Christ as your friend, the one who still calls us to bear fruit. And we can do that through actions of love through actions that support, through actions that encourage, enable us to be whom God first intended. There's a story of an Irish priest who, on a walking tour of his rural parish, sees an old peasant kneeling by the side of the road praying. He's all by himself on this road, and he's just stopping and pausing to pray. Impressed, the priest says to the man, you must be very close to God. The peasant looks up from his prayers and thinks a moment, and then he smiles wholeheartedly. Yes, he's very fond of me. How much do you love Jesus? Are you willing to risk being wrapped in sandpaper or velvet? Or are you only seeking to be Christian when it's easy? How much do you love Jesus? And just as important, do you know how much Jesus loves you? Let's pray. Holy God of grace, thank you for love that is deep, unconditional, and which leads to fill, fulfilled joy. Show us your way as we strive to love others wherever Christ calls us to be and go. Hear these prayers, O oh God, we ask. Amen.